how we diagnose and treat diabetes mellitus. This is a, a bit of clinical discussion now. All of you, please focus here and mute yourself. How a patient of diabetes present clinically? Let's start about that. And then we go to the lab diagnosis. Okay, so what are the signs and symptoms of a patient of diabetes? Now, this is known as acute presentation of diabetes. See here. The classical triad of the symptoms in case of diabetes mellitus are polyuria, thirst, and weight loss. Polyuria, thirst, and the weight loss. So let me uh, clarify this for you. Now, polyuria occurs because of osmotic diuresis. Now, what is osmotic diuresis? What do you mean by that? Anyone? What is the meaning? In it all, which, which remove the fluids. Okay. Sir, all osmotically active substances which remove water and electrolyte. Good. Okay, so both of them are... Sure, sure. I'm listening. Yes? Yes? Okay, so no problem. So osmotic diuresis means, remember, we are talking about diabetes here. So there is hyperglycemia. Hyperglycemia. What that hyperglycemia is doing now? That hyperglycemia is excreting, okay, is excreting more amount of, one minute. That is excreting more amount of water than the normal. So this glucose is osmotically active substance. It always carries water along with it. And along with water or fluid, there will be electrolyte also, which is excreted. This is known as osmotic diuresis. Okay, osmotic diuresis, see there. So this osmotic diuresis, okay, occurs only when the blood glucose level exceed the renal threshold. So we all, uh, all of us have certain, you know, threshold for the excretion of glucose. And in many of the individual, that threshold is around 180 milligram, 180 milligram. So what does that mean? If our blood sugar level exceeds then 180 milligram after we eat, or even in the fasting state, then the glucose will appear in the urine. So this is known as okay renal threshold. We'll talk about that later also. So polyuria is a very important feature of diabetes, and this patient uh, urinate quite often, and in the night time, you know, they wake up more than four or five times to urinate, which is not considered normal. When they develop polyuria, they become thirsty. Okay, this thirst is because of resulting loss of fluid and electrolyte. So they drink a lot, and this is known as polydipsia. At the same time, the person will lose weight. Even in type two diabetes, okay, at the time of presentation or at the time of diagnosis, those people lose weight. And there is multiple reason for that. And those reasons are, see here, due to fluid depletion, and the accelerated breakdown of the fat and muscle secondary to insulin deficiency. In type one, there is no doubt, okay, type one diabetes, people are very lean and thin, there's severe weight loss. But even in type two, in the beginning, they may be obese, but at that period, you know, they are very surprised to find themselves losing weight. And that is an important factor which will push them to go to the hospital then it is easy for us to diagnose a type 2 diabetes because of that weight loss. Ketonuria is often present in young people and may progress to ketoacidosis if these early symptoms are not recognized and treated in time. This occurs only in type 1 diabetes. Now, why ketonuria and ketoacidosis is not seen in type 2 diabetes? Why? Anyone? Because the insulin are a present, sir, it's just deficient in the later stage. Because ketone is produced in the metabolic acidosis. Okay, good. 
Good. So I'm getting answers from the two of the students. Any anybody else? I want to hear one more answer. Yes. Some of the children is present which inhibit ketone ketone production. Good. Very nice. So see there, all of them are pointing towards the same thing. This is because of presence of insulin. In type 2 diabetes, insulin is there. Yes, insulin is there. It is being produced by the beta cell. So whenever there is presence of insulin, ketone body cannot be formed. Always remember this. But in exception of the cases, in the terminal cases of type 2 diabetes, when beta cells severely fail, means uh, just think of a situation. There is no insulin production by beta cell, which may be a very distant possibility in type 2 diabetes. Even ketoacidosis may occur. This is how you need to answer this question. In the beginning, you say, no, there is no chance because insulin is still there. If the examiner still persists with this question, then you can add this uh, you know, sentence later on that we believe we have a very good concept there. Now, let's talk about what are the symptoms of hyperglycemia, which is a very common feature of diabetes. Okay. So what are the uh, problems because of hyperglycemia? The person will become thirst, okay, thirsty, I should say, and there is a development of the dry mouth. Very, very important feature. Very early feature in many people. Okay. They often complain this with their friends or family member. Why these days I am uh, feeling dry mouth and why I am drinking more water than before? Okay, so probably they are developing diabetes here. Polyuria, excessive urine output, nocturia, nighttime urination. Remember, they wake up many times during the night time. It depends on uh, what is the control of diabetes there are, what is the level of blood sugar in them. Tiredness, fatigue, or lethargy, these are other features because of hyperglycemia again. Noticeable change in weight. There is usually weight loss, already discussed. Blurring of the vision because of hyperglycemia. Pruritus vulvae and balaritis. This is caused by genital candidiasis. This is candida albicans, a type of fungus. And in case of hyperglycemic environment, this fungal just flourishes, okay? So, pruritus bulb in female, balanitis in male. Nausea and headache, hyperphagia is excessive eating or overeating hyperphagia, and predilection for sweet food. This uh, is seen especially in type 2 diabetes. Mood change, irritability, and difficulty in concentration, and apathy, means no interest in the surrounding. These are some other features of hyperglycemia. Now, one small point I like to highlight here, it depends, you know, according to the sugar level, if it is very high, all these features are excessively seen. And this is probably, many of them features are explained by hyperviscosity of the blood. When there is a lot of glucose present in the blood, you know, it becomes thick, it is hyperviscous. And all of these features, or most of these features, I should say, are related to that. Let's move on. Now, what are the subacute presentation? A little bit slow type of presentation. The clinical onset may be over several months or years, particularly in the older patient and they may present with thirst, polyuria, and weight loss again. Okay, So these are very important features. Even in a subacute presentation, they may be found, but over a period of time. Patient may complain of such symptom as lack of energy, visual blurring, or pruritus vulvae, or even balanitis. So a bit similar a type of uh, symptoms, uh, you know, in relation to the acute presentation, but they occur over several months or even years, means they occur slowly. Now, visual blurring may be occurring because of the glucose induced change in refraction. Remember, they are older people. So uh, most of them are already having refractive error. 
and they uh, keep on frequently changing the glasses. This is known as change in refraction. This is another important, you know, manifestation of hyperglycemia. Now, sometimes complication, uh, you know, uh, are presented as the first feature. Directly, the patient presents as a complication of diabetes. And there may be a staphylococcal scale infection. This is recurrent type of infection, recurrent. We have treated it for the first time. Then again, after a you know, few weeks, the patient comes back with similar type of infection. And if this happens, remember, you need to ask one question to yourself. Why this person is having recurrent type of skin infection? Is this a case of diabetes? Is this a case of other immunodeficiency? What? So always ask question like that. Don't simply give the same medicine and send the patient. Another one is a retinopathy. This is a diabetic retinopathy, which is noted during a visit to the optician or ophthalmologist. It is one of the complications, long-term complication though. A polyneuropathy or diabetic neuropathy can say, which causing tingling and numbness in the feet or sometimes, you know, some motor weakness also. Erectile dysfunction. This erectile dysfunction okay, can lead to impotence in, a, in case of male, and this is associated with decreased blood flow to the sexual organ, and this is associated with atherosclerosis in case of diabetes. Diabetes mellitus is a very important risk factor for atherosclerosis. Other peripheral arterial disease, okay, or other atherosclerosis occurring in different arteries can result in myocard infarction, a stroke, or even peripheral gangrene. So, students already know about them. So, sometimes the patient may present like this, especially if they neglect, you know, the early features, and if they do not go to hospital, do not change their lifestyle, and uh, these are the clinical manifestations. One question, sir. Yes, yes, please. Sir, can unilateral ptosis occur in the diabetes mellitus? Of course, of course, it can occur. This is a manifestation of neuropathy. Remember, uh, cranial nerves are the peripheral nerves. Cranial nerves are peripheral nerve. So it is not, uh, you know, mandatory that both, uh, you know, uh, cranial nerves, I mean, on the both sides are affected. Sometimes even unilateral cranial nerve may be affected. So process can happen on the unilateral side. Absolutely. Now, uh, what is asymptomatic diabetes? What do you mean by this? Now, see here. Asymptomatic means lack of symptom. But probably when we do the you know, lab test, we pick, yes, this is a case of diabetes. This is known as asymptomatic diabetes. See here, glycosuria or a raised blood glucose may be detected on routine examination in individual who have no symptoms of ill health. So this is like an accidental or incidental finding or diagnosis. So when they go for the urine, routine examination, there may be presence of glucose in the urine or when they go for routine blood test and random blood sugar was done and that shows high blood sugar level, but they don't have any symptom. Glycosuria is not a diagnostic of diabetes, but indicate the need for further investigation. Who knows? This glycosuria is just there because of decrease renal threshold in that patient. We have to you know, consider that important point. If, if the renal threshold is lesser than 180, sometimes in some of the individual, it may be around 150 or 160. But that amount of blood sugar uh, you know, is not a diabetic range. So glycosuria is not absolutely diagnostic of diabetes, but it will give us the warning to do further investigation. About 1% of the population have renal glycosuria. That's what I was talking just now. This is an inherited low renal threshold for the glucose. 
transmitted either as a Mendelian dominant or recessive trait. It may run in the family as autosomal dominant or recessive disorder. And in those individuals, they simply pass uh, glucose in the urine, even in the lower range, around 150 or 160 or even 140 sometimes. But they are not diabetic according to the definition. So these are called asymptomatic portions. Okay, let's let's do one thing. Okay, uh, let's take a, a break of five minutes, just five minutes, because we want to you know finish early today. Five minutes break and uh, you know join again, or you can simply wait. You know, you don't need to. I will not cut it. Simply wait. I'll join you after five minutes. Okay, fine. Okay, sir. Daniela? 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 Daniela?
Okay. So, are you there? Here? Yes, sir. Okay. So, let's, yes, sir. let's continue then. Good. Let's continue. All of you, please uh, focus on this uh, slide, which is taken from your textbook. This is a very informative one. And in this slide, a lot of uh, you know clinical features are shown according to the different parts of our body. Now we'll talk about this uh, this uh, hands, you know, a little bit later in the next slide. We'll explain everything what happens in the hand. And the person cannot you know straighten the fingers. See there, there is a gap formation when they do something known as prayer sign. So all of these we'll talk a bit later. Uh, let's focus here on the skin. The bullosis are different bulla formation. Bulla are bigger type of vesicles. Pigmentation, granuloma annulare is an itching type of reactions. And vitiligo. Vitiligo is a type of autoimmune disorder which uh, mainly affects the skin. And this is known as marker of autoimmunity. It is not a feature of uh, diabetes. Please remember like that. It is uh, one of the associated condition, you know, of type one diabetes. The same patient may be having different autoimmune condition. So vitiligo may be there. Blood pressure. What happens to the blood pressure in case of diabetes? What is the chance of a blood pressure abnormality? Increase. Yes. Yes. Increase. High. It may be high. Okay. High. Is there any chance of having low blood pressure? Any chance of having low blood yes, pressure or not? Yes, sir. And dehydration and hypovolume. Very good. Okay. Good. So both of the answers are both of the exactly. Both of the answers are correct. Uh, usually the person is having yes, sir. So because of uh -huh. so okay, listen here. Uh, uh usually the person is having high blood pressure high blood pressure now a lot of reasons can be given here one the patients of uh, diabetes has a high chance of atherosclerosis development that will simply cause increased peripheral resistance and that is related with hypertension okay usually obese patient obesity patient are already hypertensive and that acts as a risk factor for uh, diabetes so both way you know we can uh, give the clarification here. On the other hand, if there is some complication of diabetes occurs, for example, there is hypovolemia, excessive osmotic diuresis is causing dehydration, then the blood pressure may also fall. So these are some of the important points for you. Let's move on. See that this is known as acanthosis nigricans. Acanthosis nigricans mainly present in the axillary area. This is known as velvety, you know, black discoloration of the skin. Velvety means it is raised from the surface and it is a bit of irregular type of, you know, uh, elevation there. This denotes this person is having insulin resistance. Sometime it may be seen in connection with malignancy also. In the neck, we examine for carotid pulse. We uh, hear the carotid brui, and we also check thyroid enlargement. Most of the students know the reason here. Again, atherosclerosis can occur in the carotid artery, so carotid pulse may be weaker. And when the arteries are blocked, brui can be heard. Thyroid enlargement, what is the explanation you give for thyroid enlargement? Remember, this Decrease is the case iodine. of diabetes. So because of the anti-insulin action on the thyroid hormone, it will cause yes, it diabetes. Which enforce the thyroid gland to... Hmm? So anti-insulin action of the thyroid hormone. Okay. Now, see here. Very good. So you are, you are you know, thinking in a good direction here. Remember, type 1 diabetes is an autoimmune disease. And there are different thyroid conditions which are also autoimmune in nature. Hashimoto thyroiditis and Graves disease. Both of them are associated with thyroid enlargement. 
So in the same patient, you know, these different conditions may exist together. That is excellent, uh, you know, uh, uh, explanation you can give here. Now, if the person is having excessive thyroid hormone or thyrotoxicosis, thyroid hormone raises the blood sugar level. So that can be a cause of secondary diabetes. That reason also is very acceptable. Let's move on to the head area. There is janthal asthma. There may be cranial nerve palsy and there may be decrease in the eye movement or maybe ptosis. One of the students was just asking me, what is the chance of ptosis there? See, ptosis can be seen in case of diabetes as a result of diabetic neuropathy. So which cranial nerve is affected in case of ptosis? Which cranial nerve is that? Cranial nerve 3. Very good. Very good. Cranial right. nerve 3. Nerve. Exactly. Cranial nerve 3, okay? Not 7. Many of the students are confused with facial nerve here. Facial nerve doesn't, facial nerve abnormality doesn't lead to ptosis. It is third cranial nerve, uh, which is, uh, if it is, uh, you know, involved or affected, then ptosis is happening. Now, janthal asthma is a feature of hyperlipidemia. Hyperlipidemia is very common in a case of diabetes. And that is the connection there. Other things are quite easy for you to understand. Regarding the visual acuity, okay, cataract is the opacification of the lens and fundoscopy, okay, we'll talk a bit later, but all of these are associated with diabetic retinopathy. In a long-term complication of diabetes, retina is affected. So fundoscopic examination has to be done. Cataract is a very important complication of diabetes also. And those people, they frequently change their glasses, okay? These older people are usually, they frequently change their glasses uh, because of change in refractive error as a result of hyperglycemia. This is known as exudative maculopathy. Macula is a part of retina. Now we have to check for the insulin injection site here. Insulin injection site. So which are the common insulin injection sites? See there, it is clearly shown three important sites here. Anterior abdominal wall, okay. Arm, arm area and the thigh area. These are the common sites. So we have to examine there and uh, look for some of the changes. Insulin is an anabolic hormone. So when we inject insulin at the same site, okay, there will be hypertrophy of the fat. This is known as lipohypertrophy. This is a very interesting situation. Lipohypertrophy. That's why to avoid this, we ask the patient to rotate the site. Do not always you know, inject insulin in one area. Now, another point is also here. If we give impure insulin, okay, not a human insulin, for example, some animal source of insulin is injected uh, for the treatment of uh, type one diabetes, then because of some you know, impurities there, Maybe some antigens are there, which may cause a reaction. Some of the fat may get atrophied and some other fat area may get hypertrophied. So at the same area, there may be combination of atrophy and hypertrophy together. Now this is known as lipodystrophy, lipodystrophy. So this may be seen in the insulin injection site. We'll talk about this later also, it, it will be repeated, you know, don't worry. Regarding the abdomen, examine for hepatomegaly, that is fatty infiltration of the liver, which is very common in diabetes because it is associated with hyperlipidemia. Regarding the leg, because of neuropathy, there is muscle wasting. There is sensory abnormality also because of neuropathy. Hair loss is because of autonomic neuropathy. When uh, you know sympathetic neurons are damaged, okay, there will be hair loss, alveolar as well as problem in the sweating and deep tendon reflexes are also abnormal. There is one situation which is known as necrobiosis lipoidica. This is also a type of immunological mechanism. Now in the feet, okay, we need to really, uh, you know, inspect the feet, look carefully, are there any ulcers or not, okay? What about the peripheral pulses? We need to palpate them. In the lower limb, 
we we palpate four important type of pulses one is femoral another is popliteal the third one is dorsalis pedis and another is posterior tibial we need to feel for them because this is a case of diabetes it is a very important risk factor for atherosclerosis and atherosclerosis is a cause of peripheral vascular disease so peripheral pulses may be decrease in the affected site and never forget to examine for sensation okay uh, perform the central nervous system examination look for touch pain and temperature and who knows if the person is having neuropathy you know those sensation are decrease so this is one picture which is showing neuropathic foot ulcer here because of severe loss of sensation this ulcer is found now before i go to the next slide look at this observation weight loss occurs in insulin deficiency we all know that point type 2 diabetic people are usually obese but at the time of diagnosis they may lose weight mucosal candidiasis is very common in diabetes like oral thrush in the oral cavity and genital candidiasis in case of male and female as well dehydration is a very common feature of diabetes and that results as a dry mouth okay increased thirst and uh, because this dehydration is caused by osmotic diuresis there is increased urination also and if this is a severe dehydration there is decreased tissue turnover as well you know okay this sign before air hunger also known as kushmal breathing it is an important feature in diabetic ketoacidosis okay because of the acetone which is excreted by the breath you know this kushmal breathing is important feature there so with this let's let's uh, you know move further so this all of these are a bit of you know lengthy discussion in the class so let me choose which are the very important one for you okay and later on you can do this on your own so see here so diabetes can affect every system in the body every system so we need to do a very routine and detailed examination and this is a real challenge for the medical student and even the doctors Now, regarding the eye some of the features we already talked about visual acuity it keep on changing visual acuity keep on changing because of the refractive error and how we check visual acuity in the clinical practice it is by snell and chart see this snell and chart it is kept at a 6 meter distance and ask the patient to look at the different lines there okay this is the way near vision is using the standard reading chart okay. how uh, how well the patient can read this is the way opacification of the lens is checked for cataract and fundal examination is also done with the help of ophthalmoscope and in case of diabetic retinopathy these are the findings background retinopathy and proliferative retinopathy in background retinopathy there is microaneurysm formation there may be some exudation but in proliferative retinopathy there is synthesis of new blood vessel inside the retina these are the very important point for you now when we examine the hand okay what are the findings there now the hand okay has so many important uh, finding in case of patient of diabetes there is limited joint mobility in case of diabetes which is known as chiroarthropathy okay this is painless stiffness of the joint especially the smaller joints of our hand like metacarpophalangeal joint or interphalangeal joint these are the small joints of our hand so we cannot fully extend uh, those uh, those joints up to 180 degree in case of diabetes now how we diagnose that ask the patient to do the prayer sign prayer sign means ask the patient to bring both palms closer to each other okay but if the patient cannot straighten the finger the prayer sign cannot be done properly 
there is a big gap, you know, still present between the two palms. This is one of the important feature of chronic stage of the diabetes. Dupuytren's contracture, though it is a main feature of alcoholic liver disease, it can occur in case of diabetes also, but not very commonly. Carpal tunnel syndrome can occur here. Flexor tenosynovitis can occur. Okay. Now, what is tenosynovitis? Anybody? What do you mean by that? Sir, inflammation of synovial membrane. Very good. I already got the answer. Excellent. This is inflammation of synovial sheath, which is covering the tendon. In this case, these are the flexor tendon. Okay. And this condition is known as trigger finger. At the same time, because of neuropathy, there is muscle wasting and the sensory changes. So these are the features, you know, uh, when we examine the hand. Now, the point which, which I was talking before is the insulin injection site. So what are the points there when we examine? Look area once again, the main areas which are used for the insulin injection are anterior abdominal wall, upper thigh or buttock area, or upper outer arm. Now, regarding the inspection of the site, there may be bruising, there may be lumps and bumps, which is maybe caused by lipodystrophy or lipohypertrophy. Okay? So, if we give some uh, unpurified animal insulin, then there may be lipoatrophy. If we give pure insulin, there will be lipohypertrophy. So the combination of these together is known as lipodystrophy, which are quite uh, you know uh, commonly seen if somebody is injecting insulin, and it exactly looks like this. See there, there is a big you know hypertrophied areas of a fat, lipohypertrophy here. When we examine the feet, okay, there may be involvement of the joint, which is known as charcoal joint in case of diabetes. So this is known as charcoal neuroarthropathy can be asked as a MCQ question in the exam. Palpate the lower limbs, whether they are warm enough or not. What about the peripheral pulses? It is very important finding. And don't forget to examine for the sensation and the reflexes, just to make sure this is not a case of diabetic you know, neuropathy. So let me, you know, uh, repeat once again, this, okay, is a very detailed type of examination because diabetes can affect almost every organs of the body. Now, how to confirm the diagnosis of diabetes? Definitely, this is done by blood sugar test. Okay, done by blood sugar test. Now, what are the criteria? See here. Normally, the fasting plasma glucose, this FPG is fasting plasma glucose, should be less than 100. A two hour 75 gram oral glucose tolerance test. If you do oral glucose tolerance test, then we, you know, interpret like this. Otherwise, this is also known as postprandial after eating the meal. If we do blood sugar analysis after two hours, it should be less than 140 in the normal people. And if we, you know, uh, measure hemoglobin A1C. This is known as glycosylated hemoglobin or glycated hemoglobin. It should be less than 5.7. So this is the normal one. Now, what about the pre-diabetic range? See there, fasting plasma glucose uh, ranges from 100 to 125. Two hour 75 gram oral glucose tolerance test or postprandial range is between 140 to 199 and hemoglobin A1c is between 5.7 to 6.4. At the same time, when somebody is suffering from diabetes mellitus, now look at this value. You need to remember this all the time. If it is equal or more than 126, that is fasting plasma glucose, or postprandial equal to or more than 200, then hemoglobin A1c, if you measure, it is more than 6.5, it is confirmatory for diabetes mellitus, especially if the patient is having sign and symptom. Just one reading or one abnormal reading is enough. If the patient 
doesn't have sign and symptom, I need two separate, you know, positive values. Okay, two values which should be more than this into separate occasion. So this is important one. Same thing is written here. Okay. Now, according to the old health organization, that's what we are talking right now. Same thing is written. The fasting plasma glucose uh, should be more than 126 milligram per deciliter. That is equivalent to seven millimole. Random plasma glucose or a postprandial more than 11.1 are equivalent to 200. And one abnormal lab value is diagnostic in symptomatic individual, whereas two values are needed in asymptomatic people. Okay, don't forget that. So don't label simply as a diabetic if, if the person doesn't have any sign and symptom and only one value is abnormal. You need to repeat it, you know, that's the meaning here. The glucose tolerance test is only required for borderline cases and for diagnosis of gestational diabetes. We do not do this usually in the hospital. We just do postprandial, ask the patient to have a meal, and after two hours, we take the blood sugar for the measurement. That's it. Now, this is a glucose tolerance test, you know, described by WHO. Sometimes your, your you know, examiner may ask you, uh, this is done by giving 75 gram of glucose in 300 ml of water to the patient okay and measuring blood sugar like this and these are the criteria okay the similar type of criteria now one important point there is no thing such as mild diabetes if any of the patient you know exceed this limit which are listed here they are diagnosed as diabetes and diabetes is not, not classified as a mild diabetes or severe diabetes. All of these patients later on, if we do not control the blood sugar level well, develop long-term complication. Okay, let's move on. Now, Another important part I want to highlight here is about the glycosuria and what is the relation of this glycosuria with renal threshold. Glycosuria with renal threshold. Look here, uh, you know, carefully. Look at this first, you know, graph here. This dotted line is the renal threshold. Now see that renal threshold is, you know, uh, uh, near to 180 milligram per deciliter, okay, in majority of the people. So this is almost equivalent to 180 milligram or near to 10 millimole per liter. See this, if, if it considers more than 11.1, this is the diabetic range, okay? So around 180. So in many people, if the blood sugar level doesn't cross this, you know, dotted line, there is no glycosuria. In other words, glucose doesn't come into urine. Whereas in some of the individual, this line itself is low. That means there is low renal threshold. What does that mean? Probably if blood sugar exceeds more than 140 or 150 milligram, the glucose appears in the urine in these people. They don't need to have blood sugar level equivalent to 180. This is known as low renal threshold. Impaired glucose tolerance, see this okay it is definitely increasing this uh, you know dotted line but not crossing 11.1 and diabetes when it crosses 11.1 and look at this uh, you know urine sugar here okay this is a massive amount of glycosuria it is just one plus it is just one plus and there is no uh, sugar in the urine so what is the lesson what is the take-home message from this slide? If a patient comes to you, okay, with urine analysis, and if that urine test shows glucose present in that, it doesn't confirm the diagnosis of diabetes. It doesn't confirm, but we can suspect maybe this patient is a patient of diabetes mellitus, you know, because there are some other causes as well. Now, what are the other investigation we like to do uh, in the case of diabetes mellitus? Now, other routine investigation include screening the urine for protein, 
we do that because diabetes mellitus can lead to nephropathy. So there is a proteinuria, a full blood count. It's a, it's a immunodeficient state. So there is a high chance of infection. Urea and electrolyte, again, for the renal involvement. Liver biochemistry is a routine test, you know, just to rule out some other differential diagnosis. And random lipid, okay? This is a lipid profile because diabetes is commonly associated with hyperlipidemia. Diabetes may be secondary to other conditions, which are known as secondary diabetes. We have discussed this in the previous class. It may be precipitated by underlying illness and may be associated with autoimmune disease or hyperlipidemia. Okay. Remember, especially type 1 diabetes is a type of autoimmune disease. So the same patient may be having other autoimmune diseases like myasthenia gravis, like Addison's disease, like Hashimoto's thyroiditis, like pernicious anemia. We can give those type of example. So we need to be careful. Now let's compare type one and type two diabetes. Now, all of you, uh, please uh, focus here. This is a very important question from the exam point of view. Type one, typical age of onset is less than 40. And type two, it is relatively older people. But sometimes the young, Portion also can develop type 2 diabetes if the person is obese or overweight. Duration of symptoms are weak in type 1 and months to years in type 2. Sometimes there is a silent diabetic symptom in type 2 diabetes. But type 1, they manifest a bit earlier. Regarding the body weight, in type 1, it is usually low. Okay, In the early cases, it may be normal. But type 2 are usually obese. But having said that, at the time of diagnosis of type 2 diabetes, these people also lose weight for a certain time. Ketonuria is present in type 1 diabetes, whereas in type 2 diabetes, there is no ketonuria. Now, let me ask this question. Why there is no formation of ketone in type 2 diabetes? Why? Because insulin is because present. Because there is presence of insulin in the blood. Insulin is Exactly. Yes. Very, very good. Just, just one word is enough because insulin is present. That's it. In the presence of insulin, ketone bodies cannot be synthesized. Insulin should be absent. Then only, you know, ketone can be formed. Okay. That's why it is seen in type 1 diabetes. In the terminal cases of type 2 diabetes where the beta cells are completely gone or they are, they are not having any more insulin, Ketonuria may be seen, but that is very, very rare. In type 1 diabetes, there is a rapid death without treatment with insulin because there is no insulin inside the body. Whereas in type 2 diabetes, okay, there are so many other drugs, so we can go uh, for those. Autoantibodies are present in type 1 diabetes because it's a type of autoimmune disease. In type 2, they are not present. Diabetic complication at the diagnosis is not usually present in type 1 because the manifestation is earlier. Remember, it, it just needs a few weeks for the manifestation. Whereas in type 2 diabetes, almost 25% of the cases are presented with diabetic complication at the time of diagnosis. Many of them are silent diabetic, I told you, without symptom and sign, you know, blood sugar level is high. Family history of diabetes is uncommon in type 1, but is common in type 2. And other autoimmune diseases are common in type 1. And this is a favorite question of the examiner. So just uh, take the names of few organ specific autoimmune diseases. Okay. Organ specific autoimmune disease. Just take one organ, for example, thyroid gland, stomach, adrenal gland, isn't it? Thymus, like that. And, and tell uh, what, uh, what autoimmune disease occur there. Let's move on. Now, after you know discussing this important thing, let's go to the you know management part, and this is a you know very important topic, and a lot of questions can be asked in the exam from this part. But we are, we do not you know study everything for the exam. We want to be a good doctor. There are so many diabetic patients in our family, okay, in our relatives. So if they ask us, yes, I am diagnosed with diabetes, how to manage it now? Can you explain to me? Every medical student should know at least something regarding the management, okay? So let's talk about it. 
So this management is divided into different headings, nutritional, exercise, monitoring of blood glucose and hemoglobin A1C, pharmacological management, that is with the help of medicine or drugs, and education, health education. What is diabetes? What are the long-term complication or short-term complication of diabetes? How do we control it? All these things should be told to the patient. Now see here. Okay. Now in patients with suspected type 1 diabetes, urgent treatment with insulin is required. There's no doubt about it. Insulin is the treatment of type 1 diabetes. There is no role of any oral hypoglycemic drug. In patients with suspected type 2 diabetes, the first line of therapy involves dietary and lifestyle modification. Then, if they do not you know, lead to the fall in blood sugar level, then only we add anti-diabetic drug. Always follow this guideline. In the beginning, even after the diagnosis of diabetes, you know, uh, so many doctors will go for this type of management. They explain to the patient how to you know, control the dietary intake, which type of food they should cut off from the diet, which type of food they should take in excessive amount, something like that. And what is the role of exercise, okay, physical exercise? That is known as dietary and lifestyle modification. Still, if the patient is in the diabetic range, then we have to take help of medicine. That is the meaning. One exception is there. That exception is at the you know time of diabetic diagnosis, if there is a very high HbA1c, for example, it is eight or nine already, okay, and there are a lot of symptoms present. There are already some complications present in the patient. Remember, 25% of the type 2 diabetic patient present with complication, then we don't only rely on dietary and lifestyle modification. We have to start the medicine. Along with medicine, we definitely counsel them about the dietary and lifestyle modification. What does that mean? All three okay, would be done together. Now, other risk factor for complication of diabetes need to be addressed like treatment of hypertension and hyperlipidemia, dyslipidemia, and advice on smoking cessation. All of these are important risk factors for atherosclerosis along with diabetes. And the patient has high chance of death from that atherosclerosis rather than diabetes alone. So, okay, don't only focus on the diabetes. When this type of patient comes to you, take a good history, try to find out some other risk factor and manage accordingly. Let's talk a bit about dietary management. The total amount of carbohydrate okay, in, the, in the patient of diabetes should be six, 45 to 65% of the total daily calories. So it's the same thing like other people. Even the normal people have similar amount of you know, carbohydrate intake. Protein, 15 to 20%, and fat, less than 30 and saturated fats only 10% of the total calories because the saturated fats are not good for our body. They, they promote the formation of atheroma or atherosclerosis. And saturated fat means usually they're animal fat. Now, what is the role of fiber here? Fibers are extremely important component of our diet, especially of the diabetic people. They lower cholesterol, okay? And they are present in many different types of food especially, okay, uh, these legumes, oats, different type of fruits, even vegetables, okay, cereals, so different types of fibers are present. So what is the function of this fiber in our body? Number one, they increase the satiety, increase the satiety, so that patients do not want to eat more carbohydrate. And they also slow the absorption of carbohydrate. So they lower the glycemic index. So this is important. So let me explain this again. If somebody takes pure sugar, okay, pure sugar, that is monosaccharide only, and another person is taking complex type of carbohydrate, 
that is polysaccharide. Now, monosaccharide is absorbed very quickly and it has a high glycemic index, we say, because in no time, blood sugar level shoots up and that can you know, uh, cause a release of uh, insulin. Whereas uh, in case of uh, polysaccharide or complex type of carbohydrate, it is absorbed very slowly, okay? And it is, has a lower glycemic index. So even if the patient uh, is taking carbohydrate, we should always counsel for complex type of carbohydrate in case of diabetes. That's why the sweets are contraindicated, you know? We don't allow those sweets. We don't allow the sugar in the tea because that sugar is a monosaccharide. We don't allow those fruits which are very sweet, like mango. Like ripe mango is very sweet, okay? So some sweets, uh, some fruits, sorry, are of course allowed, but they should not be very sweeter. These are the important points here. Consistent, well-balanced, small meal several times per day is the principle of dietary management. Well-balanced food and small meal several times per day rather than three or two big meal. This is not, you know, done in case of diabetes. Let's move on. Now, what is the importance of exercise in case of diabetes? This is a very, very important, you know, slide. Okay, please take a concept out of it. Exercise increases the uptake of glucose by muscle and improves the utilization. We already talked about this, if you remember in the last class also. So exercise okay, improves the uptake of glucose by muscle and improve the utilization. And during that time, okay, it doesn't even need insulin for the entry of glucose inside the muscle cells. And that is a very important point. It alters the lipid level. It increases SDL. It decreases TZ and total cholesterol. So exercise has so many benefit, okay, in the patient of diabetes. Even in the normal portion, you know, exercise has so many benefit. We all know that. So this SDL is, uh, what is SDL and what is the function of SDL? Yes, anybody? It, uh, it, it takes uh, uh, cholesterol from tissues to the liver. So. Okay, so this is high density lipoprotein, SDL. And the function is it uh, mobilizes cholesterol from the tissues towards the liver. Excellent. Okay, I'm sure all the students know this answer because this is a very common question which is asked to you. On the other hand, LDL is the bad type of cholesterol because it is uh, carrying the cholesterol from the liver towards the tissues. It deposit cholesterol there, especially if it is deposited in the blood vessel wall, then it can lead to atherosclerosis. If on insulin, okay, if the patient is, you know, on insulin, for example, patient is on type 1 diabetes and that patient wants to go for exercise, this patient should eat 15 gram of snack before beginning the exercise because there is a high chance of hypoglycemia. Check blood sugar, BS is blood sugar, before, during, and after exercising if the exercise is prolonged just to make sure the patient does, don't, or doesn't develop hypoglycemia, okay? Why hypoglycemia chance is there? Because there is increased utilization of the glucose. The glucose can enter into the muscle cell even without the help of insulin. So that's why there is a chance, but benefits are so many. So we always encourage this patient to go for exercise. Avoid trauma to the feet during exercise. Important point, because especially the long-term diabetic has a high chance of neuropathy and they do not feel pain even if there is trauma to the feet, okay? And once we don't feel pain, we ignore that trauma. So in no time, that may be, you know, infected and infection keep on increasing in case of diabetic people. So we should always counsel this important point. Avoid pounding type of activity that could cause vitreous hemorrhage. Pounding activity means vigorous type of activity or vigorous type of exercise that is not allowed. 
already there is a problem inside the eye that is called diabetic retinopathy so there is a small blood vessel growth okay uh, and those blood vessel may bleed any time caution if coronary artery disease is already there because diabetes mellitus is an important risk factor for atherosclerosis and that atherosclerosis is the cause of coronary artery disease in 90% of the time okay and how it is diagnosed we all know ask the patient to go for treadmill test okay treadmill test angiography those different things are there baseline stress test may be indicated especially in those older than 30 and with two or more risk factor for coronary artery disease that's what i am talking just now this baseline stress test is called treadmill test attach the ecg lead in the patient and then ask the patient to do you know treadmill exercise right in front of you if there is chest pain or if there is you know ischemia of the heart it would be recorded another part of the management is glucose monitoring very important step or part of the management patient on insulin should check sugar two to four times per day definitely okay because for the tight control of blood sugar that is one answer and other uh, they, they should make sure there is no episode of hypoglycemia if they are not on insulin two to three times per week is enough for example in type 2 diabetic okay they don't need to go for so you know frequent type of blood sugar checking patient should check blood sugar or glucose before meal and 2 hours after meal and subcutaneous sensor in abdomen are available they help in the continuous monitoring of blood glucose these days this is a relatively advanced type of monitoring but they are available and one important point i like to highlight here you know if a patient is monitoring glucose this frequently they can have a bit of carbohydrate as well even some sweets can be taken if the patient is monitoring glucose like this why because after taking these sweets patient can increase a bit of dose of the insulin to control that blood sugar spike but we don't counseling like this to all of the patient because they don't understand it completely and you know uh, they can uh, they can think yes doctor has told me to eat sweets so i can eat sweets now and they they take it in the other way so don't counsel uh, you know everybody like this if some very highly educated people some healthcare person for example if they are having uh, you know the diabetes and if they are checking blood sugar like this then only that point would come here now let's talk a bit about hba1c though you already know this hba1c is known as glycosylated hemoglobin or glycated hemoglobin what does that mean the glucose is attached to the hemoglobin and it will attach to the hemoglobin only if it is a high level of glucose for a relatively long period of time so hba1c measures blood level over 2 to 3 month over Two to three months. So this is an important one. So what was the control of blood sugar level in the last three months? If I check HbA1c, it will tell me. If the level is more than six point five, okay, that means this is a diabetic patient. And if the level is higher than that, you know, the blood sugar level was not controlled in the previous two to three months. it helps to ensure that patient's glucometer is accurate also definitely so what does that mean if hba1c is high for example 8 but glucometer is showing normal amount of glucose all the time that means that glucometer is definitely wrong or it's broken it's not working and patient is having false assurance yes my blood sugar level is normal but actually the fact is something else okay so this is also important you know a point of hba1c no some important points regarding the ketones we should check them during pregnancy especially gestational diabetes or even more important in case of chronic diabetic uh, uh, who are having you know a superimposed gestational diabetes as well during illness and if blood sugar level is more than 240 
ketone body uh, should be examined for, especially in type 1 diabetes. Now, pregnancy and uh, different intercurrent illness, okay, are the precipitating factor for the synthesis of ketone body. Now, with this, let's enter into the discussion of insulin therapy. Now, here, Let's talk a bit about insulin first, and then we move on to the different types of insulin and things like that in today's class. Now, insulin, okay, please mute yourself. Okay, now, insulin is produced by, you know, islet of Langerhans, especially by the beta cells. Now, after that insulin is produced, insulin will move into the portal circulation and enter into the liver. Now, see this. Almost 60% of the insulin is degraded by the liver and 40% by the kidney. This is the metabolism of insulin that we're talking, okay? Half-life of the insulin is about five to seven minutes. This is the naturally produced insulin or endogenous insulin. Just five to seven minutes is the half-life. It is safe during pregnancy. And it is the drug of choice of treatment of diabetes during pregnancy. Though few other oral drugs are also used, but as far as possible, we always prefer insulin. The usual places for injection of insulin is a bit of practical knowledge. See here, what are the common sites for the injection? The upper arm, front and side part of the thigh and anterior abdominal wall. The upper arm, front and side part of the thigh and anterior abdominal wall, especially the subcutaneous area. So the, the patient should inject insulin there. And they need to rotate the site. They should not inject the insulin in the same place all the time. They should rotate the site. Otherwise, there would be okay, a hypertrophy of the fat occurs. This is known as lipohypertrophy. This is one of the important side effects of insulin. We already talked before. If it is a pure type of insulin, if it is impure type of insulin, then there may be lipo okay, atrophy. So the combination of this term is called lipodystrophy. So to avoid this, patients should rotate the injection site for insulin. Insulin should be stored in the refrigerator and warm up to room temperature before use. So the people who are a diabetic, you know, they should have refrigerator at home. It must be used within 30 days. So these are some important you know, practical points. Now, let's talk about what are the types of insulin preparation. Ultra short acting insulin, short acting or regular insulin, intermediate acting insulin, and long acting insulin. Okay, so there are four types. Ultra short acting, short acting or regular, intermediate acting, and the long acting. It all depends on how long they act. Now, so please focus here. So this slide is telling us about short acting a regular insulin and ultra short, short acting insulin. Now, the first thing is the example of them because the MCQ question may, may ask this type of question. Humulin R or Nobulin R, R is regular, you know. Humulin R or Nobulin R are some of the trade names of short acting insulin, very commonly used in the clinical practice. Whereas regarding the ultra short acting, they are aspart and lispro. Aspart and lispro, they are ultra short acting. Now, how much is the you know time difference between the you know effect of this insulin? You see this: the onset of action in regular is 30 to 45 minutes if we give it subcutaneously. Regarding the ultra short acting, it is zero to 15 minutes. It can act so quickly you know, up to 15 minutes, there is already the effect of insulin. That's why it is known as ultra short acting. Peak serum level two to four hour, peak serum level 30 to 90 minute. Duration of action, it lasts around six to eight hour and it just lasts three to four hour. Usual administration two to three times per day for regular insulin. And it is also two to three times day or even more for ultra short acting, depends on the situation. Now, what are the uses? Okay, both are, very commonly used in type 1 diabetes, there is no doubt. Type 1 diabetes, especially they are designed to control the postprandial hyperglycemia and 
uh, if the patient develops some complications of diabetes, like diabetic ketoacidosis, then uh, these short acting or ultra short acting insulins are used. Intermediate acting insulin, these are the example isofen, okay? This isofen uh, is also known as NPH or neutral protamine hagedone. Neutral protamine hagedone, NPH. This is the full form, isofen. Now, this is a combination, okay? Uh, of the you know insulin actually uh, regular insulin is mixed with some zinc preparation and then intermediate acting insulin will be there so this is a turbid type of suspension uh, it is injected only subcutaneously the onset of action is uh, around one to two hour time peak serum level five to seven hour and look at the duration of action this is important the duration of action is 13 to 18 hour. That's why this is intermediate acting insulin. Now, when we give to the patient, we have to mix the insulin together. We need to mix the intermediate acting insulin with regular insulin uh, because uh, we, we need to control the blood sugar level at different time. Let me explain this. And this is a common type of mixture, 75 to 25, 70 to 30, or 50-50. Now see this, the 75 is NPS or intermediate acting insulin and 25 is the regular one. So this is just one way, you know. Some doctor may use the, in this way, 70-30 and some other doctor may use in 50-50 also. Now, what is the principle for this? Immediate postprandial rise in blood sugar is controlled by regular insulin. Postprandial rise in blood sugar is controlled by regular insulin, whereas the long-term control is done by intermediate acting insulin. For example, throughout the night, if the blood sugar needs to be controlled, okay, then it is done by intermediate acting. But immediately after dinner, okay, immediately after dinner, within two hours, if that control, uh, you know, we think of then regular insulin will come into the picture. That is the way. Now, another example of intermediate acting insulin is called lenti insulin. Okay, this lenti is a mixture of 30% semi lenti and 70% ultra lenti solution. So semi lenti and ultra lenti, if you mix together, it will become lenti solution. So, this is a turbid type of suspension, it is not clear. It is also injected subcutaneously. The onset of action is one to three hour, peak serum level 48 hour, and duration of action is 13 to 20 hour. Now, it is even longer, okay, than the NPH. Another one is the long acting insulin. You see there? So uh, this is the, you know, last important types of insulin preparation, long acting insulin. And one of the good example here is insulin glargine. Okay, insulin glargine. Now, onset of action of insulin glargine is two hour. It is absorbed less rapidly than NPS and lenti insulin. And the important point here is the duration of action. It is up to 24 hour. So it can cover the rise in blood sugar up to 24 hour. So this is a very important advantage of long acting insulin. It is designed to overcome the deficiencies of intermediate acting insulin because they do not act more than 18 hour. Okay, so what about that remaining six hour? Then that is covered by long acting insulin. And these are the advantages over intermediate acting insulin, like the constant circulating insulin is available over 24 hour with no pronounced peak. And it is more safe than NPS and lenti solution due to a reduced risk of hypoglycemia, especially the nocturnal hypoglycemia. And what is the reason for this? Because there is no pronounced peak. Throughout 24 hour, it has got constant level of insulin. And this is important one. Now, all of you, please, uh, you know, look at this graph, okay? See here? 
So this is glucose infusion rate, and this is the time, okay, after administration of this important drug. Now see this, this is the insulin glargine, and this is NPS. Now NPS suddenly, you know, uh, becomes more in the circulation, and after a certain time, it cannot, you know, uh, uh, control the blood sugar level, whereas it is a constant one, okay? The control of blood sugar is a constant one in case of glargine. So this is a definite advantage of glargine over NPH. The local and systemic allergic reactions are more common if the insulin is not very pure. That means if it is an animal source of insulin, not a human insulin. Human insulin is a pure type of insulin, you know? So those allergic reactions are very minimal. And another one, sometimes in intermediate and long-acting insulin, we, we add some other substances. So our body may become allergic to the substance, but they are a bit rare also. Insulin lipodystrophy, I already talked about uh, many times. This is a combination of atrophy and hypertrophy. Lipohypertrophy is a feature of pure type of insulin. If it is you know, persistently injected in the same site. And lipoatrophy, okay, is a feature of impure type of insulin. The combination term is lipodystrophy. And insulin resistance can occur, again, if the animal source or impure type of insulin is injected to the patient. Now, there are two very important phenomena or effect after insulin therapy. Very common question in the VIVA exam or MCQ exam. These are called Dawn phenomena and Shomogi effect. So please pay attention at the, you know, after we, we do this discussion, every student should be very clear what is the difference between Dawn phenomena and Shomogi effect. Now, Dawn phenomena means there is a morning hyperglycemia and that hyperglycemia occurs between 2 a.m. and 8 a.m. in a patient of diabetes mellitus who is treated with insulin therapy, okay? Now, what may be the cause for this? Hyperglycemia is not caused by insulin, isn't it? So what is the mechanism for this? The causes or mechanism is there is a nocturnal surge of growth hormone at night. Okay. There is a nocturnal surge of growth hormone. Now, what is the function of growth hormone? It will lead to increase in blood sugar level. Growth hormone is a type of counter regulatory hormone for insulin, so it elevates the blood sugar level. So that clearly explains hyperglycemia. It may also be caused by insufficient insulin the night before, insufficient anti-diabetic medication doses, or if the patient takes carbohydrate snack at the bedtime. All of these will elevate the blood sugar level. See that insufficient insulin definitely elevate the blood sugar level. Insufficient anti-diabetic medication, same thing. And if the patient taking carbohydrate snacks or meal at the bedtime, a bit late, you know, then also there will be chances of morning hyperglycemia. This is not a done phenomena. Regarding the treatment, avoid the carbohydrate snacks at bedtime. This, if patient is doing that, you know, probably that is the cause. So we avoid, tell the patient to avoid it. Adjust the dose of medication or insulin. Change the time of medication or insulin from dinner time to bedtime. A little bit delay the insulin, you know, injection so that it will cover that hyperglycemia during the morning hours. And use an insulin pump to administer extra insulin during early morning hour just to control that hyperglycemia. So these are the different types of treatment we can go for. The point is, uh, you know, what is the meaning that is really important? Now, what is Shomogi effect then? See this? This is the Shomogi effect. Shomogi effect means there is a nocturnal hypoglycemia occurs first. And that nocturnal hypoglycemia is followed by rebound hyperglycemia in the morning hours. Remember in dawn phenomena, there was no nocturnal hypoglycemia. But in Shomogi effect, first of all, the nocturnal hypoglycemia occur, and that is followed by rebound hyperglycemia in the morning hours. So both of the conditions are having hyperglycemia in the morning hour, 
but the mechanism is different. One is Down phenomena, another is called Schomburg effect. So to avoid this, we have to decrease the evening dose of insulin because if uh, insulin is in higher dose, that insulin is causing hypoglycemia. That hypoglycemia is uh, causing increased level of counter-regulatory hormone and that counter-regulated hormone is causing rebound hyperglycemia. So this is the mechanism of Schumog effect. So one of the common question which is asked to you, if you have clearly understood or not, see here, what's the difference between a Down phenomena and a Schumog effect? Now to answer this, okay, uh, you should uh, you know include this point. Down phenomena is not associated with nocturnal hypoglycemia. Okay. Usually there is hyperglycemia all the time. And Shomog effect is definitely associated with hyperglycemia in the middle of the night, followed by rebound hyperglycemia in the morning hour. This is one answer. And another one to determine what is the you know, cause, we have to test the blood sugar level at a different time. Test at night time before going to bed, test at 3 a.m. and upon awakening especially at around 3 a.m. or even before that, you know, if there is hypoglycemia detected, then probably this is a Schumog effect. If hypoglycemia is not detected, it is a Down phenomena. Let's move further. What are the methods of insulin delivery? A, a bit of practical knowledge again. These are delivered with the help of insulin pen, insulin injectors, insulin pump, implantable device, and even transplantation of pancreatic beta cells. Okay, and these are the modern way. And this is still under the research actually. So uh, when we start working in the hospital, you know, it is very easily learned. Uh, different uh, instruments are there to inject the insulin. Now, before I move further towards the oral, you know, anti-diabetic drug, one important uh, you know, concept need to take from this slide. Sometimes the patient takes too much dose of insulin and the patient presents to the hospital in the state of coma. Remember this, okay? Now, how to differentiate the patient who is in uh, you know, hypoglycemia, okay? Or how to differentiate that patient from diabetic ketoacidosis? because diabetic ketoacidosis will also cause uh, you know, loss of consciousness and it is an important complication of type 1 diabetes. So how to differentiate these two? When I working in the emergency department, you know, uh, I don't know the patient, right? So both of them, they may look a bit similar because of the unconsciousness level. So let's talk a little bit about this, how to differentiate them. The onset of a hypoglycemic shock, this shock is a misnomer term here, okay? Uh, this is not a, a real type of shock. This term is used for the unconsciousness condition here. Onset is rapid, and in diabetic ketoacidosis, it is slow. It takes over several days. The amount of insulin, if we measure, is excessive in case of hypoglycemic shock, whereas in case of diabetic ketoacidosis, it is nil or too little. That is the cause of DKA. Acidosis and dehydration doesn't occur in hypoglycemia, whereas it is a common feature in diabetic ketoacidosis. Both of them are very common. Acidosis and dehydration, okay? Both of them are common. Regarding the sign and symptom, blood pressure is normal or slightly elevated because of the sympathetic uh, nervous system stimulation because of hypoglycemia. Blood BP is slightly elevated also, but in DKA, because of severe dehydration, it is subnormal or a patient is already in shock. And this shock is hypovolemic shock here. Regarding the respiration, this is normal or shallow. And in case of DKA, this is known as Kusmal breathing. So it is deep or having air hunger. Regarding the skin, the patient is having pale and sweaty skin. And in case of DKA, it is hot and dry. In the CNS presentation, both of them may present with coma, okay? But along with that, there may be tremors and there may be convulsion also. And before the patient develops coma, the patient may be confused. But in DKA, usually 
that is generalized depression of the central nervous system patient usually presents with coma the important point here is a measurement of blood sugar which we always do in a patient of diabetes and that alone will give you the diagnosis now see this hypoglycemia the blood sugar is lower than 70 it is usually uh, much lower than that sometimes 20 30 or even 40 okay but in a dk it is usually very high usually more than 200 or sometimes 300 or even 400 like that ketones are normal or they are not formed actually normal means they are not formed and in dk they are elevated so why this slide is included sometimes you know you may confuse hypoglycemic coma with diabetic ketoacidosis so don't get confused like that now with this discussion let's enter into the another type of management of diabetes that is by use of oral drug they are known as oral anti-diabetic drug all of them are taken orally in the form of tablet and patients with type 2 diabetes have you know two physiological defect and that's why they need to take these medicines for the management now what are those two physiological defect now see here first is abnormal insulin secretion and second, resistance to insulin action in the target tissue associated with decreased number of insulin receptors. This is purely a form of insulin resistance. So abnormal insulin secretion or a relative decreased level of insulin secretion is one. Second is the insulin resistance. So we need to develop or we need to use those medicine which act on these two important physiological defects. Okay, and these are oral anti-diabetic drug. Now, see that? So they are roughly divided into uh, two broad heading, sulfonyl ureas and drugs other than sulfonyl ureas. So oral anti-diabetic agent or drug are sulfonyl urea, a drug other than sulfonyl urea. So let's enter into them. So let's classify the sulfonyl urea first. Sulfonyl ureas are classified under first generation and second generation drugs. So first generation are again short acting, intermediate acting, and the long acting. And these are the examples. Please try to remember this example. Okay, repeat them until and unless you remember the name. These are very commonly asked in the exam. So tall butamide is a short acting first generation sulfonyl urea. Acetohexamide and tolazamide are intermediate acting, whereas chlorpropamide is a long acting first generation sulfonyl urea drug. Regarding the second generation, we have again short acting and long acting. So glipizide is a short acting, whereas glivenclamide, okay, a gliburide is another, another name for glivenclamide, and glimepiride are the long acting ones. Okay, a bit of similar type of names there. So we need to repeat this many times till we remember the name. Now let's, you know, compare some of the important member of first generation sulfonyl urea medicine. So see this, tolbutamide is a short acting, acetohexamide is intermediate acting along with tolasamide and chlorpropamide is a long acting. Now, what is the duration of action this will clearly tell you why these are short acting intermediate acting or long acting six to eight hour is a short acting one 12 to 20 or 12 to 18 hour is the intermediate acting and 20 to 60 hour is the long acting this is a very long acting okay almost up to three days these are the half life okay they are uh, quite well absorbed uh, from the gi tract except tolazamide is a bit of slow, uh, you know, absorbed and excretion is in the urine. What about the second generation sulfonyl urea? So glipizide, glivenclamide and glimepiride. Okay, short acting and the long acting. So they are, all of them are well absorbed from the GI tract. Half-life is three to four hour. Okay, it is less than three hour in glivenclamide and five to nine hour in glimepiride. Duration of action, see there, up to 24 hours regarding the long acting and up to 16 hours in the short acting. And all of them are excreted again in the urine. 
Now, the important part here, what is the mechanism of action of sulfonylurea? Very commonly asked question in the exam. Please pay attention. This sulfonylurea have their own receptor, okay, in the beta cell. If you remember that mechanism, which we talked long time ago, there is a receptor of sulfonylurea in the beta cell. So they act on their own receptor, okay? And after acting on the receptor, you know, they block or close the potassium channel. After closing the potassium channel, the membrane depolarization occur, which leads to opening up calcium channel. Then calcium will enter into the cell. That leads to release of insulin from the beta cell. Okay. So this is one of the major action of sulfonylurea. They lead to release of insulin from the beta cell. That's why in type 1 diabetes, there is no use of sulfonylurea because there is no insulin in the beta cell. Whereas in type 2 diabetes, there is still insulin present and that insulin has to be secreted a little bit in more amount. So we stimulate those beta cells with the help of sulfonylurea drug. The second mechanism of action, okay, that's a reduction of serum glucagon concentration. So this will again helps in the hypoglycemia. And there is potentiation of insulin action on the target tissue. So this is about the insulin sensitivity. But the most important action is the first one. Now, if we use this sulfonylurea for a relatively longer duration, what are the side effects? Important question from the exam point of view again. I'll definitely tell you which are the important questions here, okay? The first one or the very common side effect are the nausea, vomiting, abdominal pain, and diarrhea. These are called, okay, these are very non-specific side effect because they are present in so many other conditions as well. A hypoglycemia is probably the most important side effect. And why hypoglycemia is the side effect of sulfonylurea drug? Why? Because insulin is secretion in a more amount and they act on the target Colleen. cell and enter the glucose. To the cell. Exactly, exactly. I'm sure every student can answer this. It is because of insulin. Sulfonylurea is producing more insulin from the beta cell. That insulin is the cause of hypoglycemia. Never forget this. Another one, see there, if we use chlorpropamide, there is dilutional hyponatremia in the patient. And that dilutional hyponatremia is also known as water intoxication. This dilutional hyponatremia is caused by SIADH, syndrome of inappropriate ADH secretion. Okay, uh, without, you know, any, you know, non or, you know, well, you know, established mechanism, the ADH is released here. And the function of ADH, we all know, it, it you know, retains only water in the body that is known as water intoxication. And that water will dilute the amount of sodium that is known as dilutional hyponatremia. So this is an important MCQ question for you in the exam. Okay, so let me underline this for you. Dilutional hyponatremia because of chlorpropamide. Chlorpropamide has another important side effect also that is known as disulfiram-like reaction with alcohol. Another important question in the exam. Now, let me clarify this for you. Disulfiram is a drug which is known as antabuse-like drug. What is the meaning here? If somebody is taking alcohol for a longer duration and, uh, you know, th that person has decided to, you know, avoid drinking alcohol or that person is admitted in the in those center okay uh, then we we want to use certain medicine which will uh, which will not you know uh, make them drink alcohol again we want to produce some side effect which are very adverse in nature you know in the presence of those drugs if they drink alcohol they will not feel good at all there is burning sensation all over the body did those person develop nausea and vomiting? Okay, there is an increased heat-like sensation in the body. 
This is known as NWs like reaction or disulfiram like reaction. And chlorpropamide and metronidazole as well as tinidazole are the drug which act like a disulfiram like reaction. So I can write here tinidazole and metronidazole also. So what, what is the message you got? If somebody is uh, taking metronidazole or tinidazole for the treatment of some dysentery or something like that, don't go for the drinking that time. You may develop disulfiram-like reaction, which is not pleasant for the patient. Another one is a weight gain. This weight gain is also done by insulin. Insulin is anabolic hormone, and that anabolism is responsible for weight gain. Blood dyscrasia are not common and it is developing less than 1% of the patient. That means again, okay, some disorder of the blood, probably they may you know, suppress bone marrow. That is not uh, you know, common. And cholestatic obstructive jaundice is also occur uh, in some of the sulfonylurea. Again, chlorpropamide may be responsible here. Let's move on. Now, what are the contraindications of sulfonylurea use? Type 1 diabetes is definitely a contraindication. This is also known as insulin-dependent diabetes. There is no insulin at all. So why to use sulfonylurea? Okay, it, it just causes side effect. Parenchymal diseases of the liver or kidney are the contraindication. So liver disease and kidney disease should be ruled out. And that is very easy to rule out. Just go for a liver function test or renal function test. If they are normal, then only use sulfonylurea. Pregnancy and lactation are other condition where sulfonylurea is contraindicated. We use insulin in this situation. Now, drugs that augment the hypoglycemic action of sulfonylurea, what are the list or what are the important example? So what, what do you mean by that? If we use this drug along with sulfonylurea, then the chance of hypoglycemia will be even more. That is known as augmentation. Warfarin, sulfonamide, salicylate, alcohol, chloramphenicol, and fluconazole. These are the example. Now, many of them are associated with displacement of sulfonylurea from the plasma protein binding site. And that is how they are causing further hypoglycemia. Okay, because free sulfonylurea may be present in the blood, and that can lead to you know quick hypoglycemia in the patient. So, what is the message? Do not combine these drugs together. Now, another part of this lecture: what are the drugs other than sulfonylurea? Okay. So please pay attention. Probably you have not done these things before. These are megalitinide, biguanate, alpha glucosidase inhibitor, and thiazolidinediones. Okay, thiazolidinediones. These are the examples. Very difficult type of pronunciation. So even if you do not know these, you know, difficult terms, just need to know the name of the drug, and these are quite easy for us. Look at these megalitinides now, repaglinide. And nateglinide are the good example here. Repaglinide and nateglinide. These end with glinide term. See this suffix glinide. So easy to remember, meglitinide. Biguanate, metformin, very commonly used drug. Probably the most commonly used drug in the management of type 2 diabetes, metformin. Alpha glucosidase inhibitor, a carbose. And, you know, Thiazolidinediones, resiglitazone, and pioglitazone. These are called glitazone. Remember the glitazone drug. So these are the drug other than sulfonylurea. All of them are classified under oral anti-diabetic drug. Let's move on. Now let's elaborate a little bit about each of them. Now what about meglitinide now? Now, repaglinide and nateglinide are the example. They are taken orally. That's why they are, they are discussed under oral anti-diabetic drug. 
the rapidly absorbed, okay, the peak serum concentration is achieved in one hour. They are metabolized by liver. So we, sh we should be careful under liver diseases. The T half is one hour, okay. Duration of action is around four to five hours. These are the not very important point. These are pure pharmacological knowledge and pure pharmacological questions are very rarely asked in the medicine. We ask those questions which are clinically correlated. Now see there, what is the mechanism of action of megalitinide? This is important. They bind to the same, okay, potassium ATP channel as do sulfonyl urea and they cause insulin release from the beta cell. So the action is almost like sulfonyl urea. And if the actions are same, the effect is also same. Now, look at the clinical uses. They are approved as monotherapy and in combination with metformin in type 2 diabetes. Now, monotherapy means in a single therapy. They can be used alone in the management of type 2 diabetes or we can combine these megalitinide with metformin in the management of type 2 diabetes. They are taken before each meal and three times a day. And they, they do not offer any advantage over sulfonylurea. So if we are using sulfonylurea, you know, you don't need to go for megalitinide. Either megalitinide or sulfonylurea, there is a choice between them. And one important advantage is of this, they can be used in the patient who are allergic to sulfonylurea or sulfur compound. Regarding the side effect, hypoglycemia, because they lead to increased release of insulin, just like sulfonylurea. Weight gain, again, because of insulin effect, but we need to be cautious in the patient with renal and hepatic impairment because they're excreted uh, by the urine and they are metabolized by the liver. Let's move on. Now, the second, uh, you know, types of oral anti-diabetic drug, which are known as drugs other than sulfonylurea are biguanides, okay, biguanides. Metformin is the drug here, okay. Another example is fenformin, but fenformin is not commonly used these days because of lactic acidosis side effect. So metformin is the example here. It is given orally. It doesn't bind to plasma proteins. It is not metabolized. Look at the important points here. So this is a good one. And it is excreted unchanged in the urine. The T half, you know, half-life is six hours. This is about the metformin drug. Now, how it acts, this is really important point. Please pay attention. This metformin increase the peripheral glucose utilization. It inhibit gluconeogenesis and impaired absorption of glucose from the gut or GI tract. So these are very, very important action of metformin. So let me repeat again. It increased the peripheral glucose utilization. That means the entry of glucose inside the cell is better. Second, it inhibits gluconeogenesis in the liver. So new glucose formation is also blocked. And third, it doesn't allow good absorption of glucose from the gut. That's what we want in a diabetic patient. Okay, so all of them will result in a decrease, uh, you know, uh, blood sugar in a diabetic patient. Now, what are the advantages of metformin over sulfonylurea? Important question asked the student. Why these metformin are so popular these days in the management of type 2 diabetes? Metformin doesn't cause hypoglycemia. And why is this? Why? Because of no effect on There's insulin. There's no, no secretion of insulin. No effect of insulin. Exactly. Exactly. I'm sure... Okay, you can answer this correctly if this question is asked anytime because they don't uh, cause excessive release of insulin from the beta cell. That's why they do not 
cause hypoglycemia. Okay, remember this. And they do not lead to weight gain because of the same reason. And they are ideal for obese patient management who are having diabetes, especially okay, type 2 diabetes. These people are usually obese. So they are the excellent drug for the management uh, in this patient. And another important point, these days, even uh, you know those people who are not diagnosed as type 2 diabetes, but they are only obese, they are also taking you know, metformin you know, for the control of obesity. That is not usually allowed, you know, uh, that is not one of the indication of metformin, but, you know, uh, different peoples are using it because it decreases the glucose absorption from the GI tract. It increases the glucose sensitivity, okay? That means the entry of glucose in the peripheral tissue. And these are really beneficial effect in the obese patient. What are the side effects of biguanates then? Some of the side effects are it causes or produces metallic taste in the mouth, just like metronidazole. It also produces metallic taste. Some GI effects are there like anorexia, nausea and vomiting, diarrhea and abdominal discomfort. These are very non-specific and can be tolerated quite easily. And one of the uh, important you know, side effect may be lactic acidosis, but it is very rare with metformin. And it is common with fenformin. It's another member of biguanide family. And that's why fenformin is not used these days uh, regarding the management of type 2 diabetes. So overall, this is a safe drug. Another member, okay, of oral anti-diabetic drug under drugs other than sulfonylurea are alpha-glucosidase inhibitor and acarbose is a member, acarbose. So it is given orally just like any other drug. It is not absorbed from the intestine except a small amount. This is the T half, three to seven hour, and it is excreted with the stool. What is the action of this? It inhibit the intestinal alpha-glucosidase enzyme. And by inhibiting this enzyme, it delays the carbohydrate absorption, which will cause decreasing level of postprandial blood sugar. So in a very simple you know, term, let me explain this. It inhibits glucose absorption from the intestine. Okay, And by doing that, it decreases postprandial increase in blood glucose. This is a carbose. Now, some of the side effect of a carbose will be flatulence because it is not absorbed on its own. It remains there in the intestine. That's why flatulence or excessive gas formation may be there, a loose stool or diarrhea and abdominal pain. This loose stool or diarrhea may be caused by, you know, because that, uh, that uh, carbohydrate which is not absorbed probably will convert into some acidic form later on in the distal colon. And that may result in loose stool or even diarrhea in some of the people. Now, regarding the indication of alkaglucosidase inhibitor, patients with type 2 diabetes mellitus, inadequately controlled by the diet alone, we can give a trial of uh, acarbose. And it may be helpful in obese type 2 patients similar to metformin. But in the comparison of metformin, it is not a very popular drug. Okay, Metformin is very, very commonly used. The last one on our list okay, is Thaya Jolie Dinedione derivatives. And these are the new class of oral anti-diabetic drug. The examples are glitazone. These are called glitazone. See this? Okay. Glitazone. Rosiglitazone and pioglitazone. So they are 99% absorbed from the GI tract. They're metabolized by the liver. 99% of the drug binds to plasma proteins like albumin. And the half-life is three to four hour. And they are eliminated by the urine as well as fecal matter all are, you know, basic pharmacological property. 
Now, what are the indication, okay, mechanism of action and the adverse effect of this glitazone? Regarding the indication, they are used in type 2 diabetes, definitely, not in type 1. Type 2 diabetes alone or in combination with metformin or sulfonylurea or even insulin in patient who are resistant to insulin treatment. Now, why we are talking about that in mechanism of action? Because they increase the sensitivity, okay, to insulin by the target tissue. That insulin sensitivity is increased by this glitazone. So they are a good drug in the treatment of type 2 diabetes. They also reduce hepatic glucose output, okay, and increase glucose uptake, as well as oxidation in the muscle and adipose tissue. So this is further uh, effect of glitazone. So see this, reduce hepatic glucose output. That's why they decrease the blood sugar level. They increase glucose uptake and oxidation in the muscles and adipose tissue. These are the good point for the treatment of diabetes. They do not cause hypoglycemia because they do not increase the release of insulin, just like in metformin or acarbos. Regarding the adverse effect, okay, they lead to mild to moderate edema, weight gain, headache, and myalgia, which can be tolerated by the patient. Now, uh, let me ask one question. Which are the drugs which cause hypoglycemia and which are the drugs which do not cause hypoglycemia in the treatment of diabetes? Yes? Which are those? Sulfonylurea, which cause hypoglycemia, and uh, metformin, which cannot cause hypoglycemia. Very good. Okay, so you already 